right, good afternoon. Um, so to start off, uh, how many of you have been to at least one session on uh, over-the-air updaters or updaters during the conference? Okay, almost all of you. Um, yeah, so there's quite a few of them. And uh, the challenge for me, obviously, is to try not to bore you by talking about something that's already been spoken about. Uh, so it gets harder and harder, uh, as I'm probably the last session uh, about uh, updaters. So uh, I'll try to, to talk uh, about or cover more in-depth things that haven't been covered already. And let's see. Uh, so just a quick introduction. Uh, that's my name, Einstein Stenberg, very close to Einstein but not quite. Um, I've been working uh, for seven years in um, uh, systems and security management software. Uh, I have a background from computer science, uh, cryptography, so security related. Uh, you have my email there. If you have any comments, feedback on the talk, uh, either let me know afterwards or uh, email me. Greatly appreciated as I do talks across uh, several conferences, it's always good to improve what people like and, uh, and uh, don't like. So Mender, what I work on now is uh, over-the-air updater for Linux. Uh, we integrate with the Yocto project, so make it easy to work uh, with over-the-air updates for, uh, uh, if you base your uh, build on the, on the Yocto project tools. Uh, it's fully open source, Apache, License version two. Uh, the way it works is using a dual AB rootfs. Uh, we also have a remote deployment management server, which is also open source. Uh, and yeah, we're still actively developing it. Uh, you can test the server as well if you if you try online. That's a quick overview. So this may not be in use to you since you're here, but. Uh, uh, the proposition is that you must have a way to update the connected devices. A couple of examples uh, with respect to bugs. Uh, it might be a bit small for you to see here, but basically these are the kernel uh, versions that you can see on the vertical axis for the Linux kernel. And uh, the red bars indicate critical security vulnerabilities that are in or present in those kernel versions. Uh, the orange bars indicate um, high severity uh, issues with the kernel. So you can see at least one of the uh, red bars there stretches pretty far. So if you're on uh, one of these kernel versions, you should have a way to, to fix it. And obviously there are probably things we don't know about yet uh, also. So that's typically the motivator for um, over-the-air updates to to fix, fix these issues that we don't yet know about. Uh, and uh, there's also a couple of interesting examples on, on these vulnerabilities happening. Uh, one was the Fiat Chrysler hack last year, where they managed to compromise a car and control it remotely due to, a, well, in part due to a vulnerability in, in software. Um, and of course, you also want the ability to deploy new features. Um, yeah, so recently there's been several tools that are open source to do over the air updates or, or um, do software updates. Um, but still, most companies write it from scratch, I guess it's because it's fairly recent that there are more generic tools to do it. Um, and we'll cover a, a bit more on this later. Um, and uh, obviously the reason to reuse one of the existing tools is to avoid the development cost. Uh, so you can focus more on what your core product should do rather than messing with uh, copying files and making sure this is very robust. Uh, and uh, one of the counter arguments that I frequently have seen to using an existing tool is that doing an over-the-air update is so easy. Uh, so you can just download a file, 
and then you just uh, run it, right? It's just a script, copy over some files, and it will work. Uh, but if you look a bit down the, under the hood, uh, you will find a lot of interesting challenges, and we'll look a little bit uh, at that as well. And then there's the maintenance aspect, of course. So if you manage to make it reliable and it works, then uh, how long are you going to maintain this uh, updater? Is uh, your product out there for five years? You still need to maintain this updater. Uh, do you have uh, one product or five products, 10 products? Do you need to tweak the updater based on the product? So there's all these costs that uh, come later as you uh, develop your, your own uh, tool. Uh, so of course, uh, uh, I have my favorite tool here, so unlike the other presentations, I will not talk about tools or serving tools because uh, you shouldn't uh, trust uh, that I'm not biased. Um, but um, this is how I structure the session instead. So uh, I, we've talked to, well, probably close to 100 embedded developers at this point, uh, but we did uh, a survey we asked consistently some questions that I'll cover uh, across 30 interviews that we've done. So uh, it might give you some, some interesting insights if you have your own update or two, like what other people are doing. Um, and then we'll look a bit at the embedded environment and the criteria that people say they have for the embedded updater. And then a bit more on the, uh, how you can address those problems or requirements. Um, so the first thing we asked was, uh, uh, do you have a way to update your software? And uh, about half said no, and the other one, they said yes with a homegrown solution. Uh, so it was really hard to find somebody that actually used um, a more generic tool. Uh, I think this is change this was done maybe yeah, between six and nine months ago now. So I think it's changed a bit. I think more people are using uh, using a, a, a tool that's purpose built for, for doing updates. Uh, I don't know if you recognize, so how many have their own updater, have written their own updater? Okay, it's maybe one third now then. Um, and how many use uh, a tool that's made for updating? Like, yeah, one of the updater tools that's out there. Okay, two people. Okay. Interesting. So I hope you're growing. Um, so then there's the eventual debate about uh, how to do the updates. Uh, the two big camps are image or package based and uh, the people we asked, so you can always reason about this, obviously, uh, but the people we asked, they, about half of them preferred image-based, and the reasons they gave was that it's atomic, meaning that either the update is applied or it's applied in full or not, uh, and consistent, that's an interesting one where it makes it much easier for you to test uh, that the test device is the same or very similar to the production device. Because if you flash a device completely, then uh, there's a very good chance that if it works in test, it will also work in a production environment. Uh, so for the package based, which you can see in the red here, uh, the arguments were typically that it's faster to install, uh, easy to develop if you have a build system already that outputs RPMs or IPKG. It's, and you develop your home grown tool for this, uh, then the development cost is not that high, or initial development cost at least. And then there's always the, the bandwidth concern depending on, on your bandwidth, but in, typically in embedded we aren't um, lucky to have a lot of, of bandwidth. But there's also differences here if you use 3G networks and, and similar uh, expensive networks. Um, then we looked a bit at how 
long it took to make a homegrown updater um, and how it frequently was used. So typically people spent maybe three to six months. It varied quite a bit, but uh, this was in, in the average, three to six months to make it. And then you have to maintain it. Uh, and then how frequently you deploy updates, about six times a year, but we also saw that um, people did it more frequently now than it used to. And uh, I think one of the reasons is that more devices are getting connected now, so it's possible to do uh, scalable remote updates now, uh, or easier at least. Um, so what we found is that uh, there is uh, still some room to, uh, to make this better. Uh, but the good thing uh, is that if you're not doing updates yet, uh, you're not far behind the average. So, um, and uh, as you can see on these sessions that we have uh, at the conference, I think at least five uh, talks about over-the-air updates. So at least there's a lot of more interest for it now. So we can see that it's going in the uh, right uh, direction and uh, like I mentioned I think the connectivity aspect is the biggest driver uh, also known as the IoT in buzzword form uh, which is yeah the same as a connected embedded devices as, as you know any questions or does that make sense okay so why so how, how does the update environment look like for embedded? Um, so there are some things that make it a bit harder. Uh, we all know this guy, uh, maybe it's ourselves in the beginning that uh, think, well, this can't be that hard. But um, first thing is that it's quite expensive to reach these devices if something bad should happen, if they get bricked. As you know, it might be quite expensive to send somebody out to actually do a, a physical fix of the devices. Uh, they have a long lifetime as well, five to 10 years maybe on average. Uh, unreliable power, so the battery might run out if, if you have battery. Uh, you might start the update and then you run out of battery or somebody unplugs the device for some reason. Uh, and then what happens the next time you boot the device? Does it still work or is it able to recover? Uh, last thing is the, the network. So for example, in 3G connections, um, the device may move to a tunnel if it's a car, for example, and you uh, started the download of an update, uh, and then you lose network, and then you get out of the tunnel, and then you start the download from scratch again. Uh, and then you never finish because it's this infinite loop of lost network. So you need to handle that uh, in some way as well. Uh, and you have l lower bandwidth than you have in Ethernet networks, obviously. And uh, uh, also the security aspect is a bit interesting. I've seen some set-top boxes where they made their own updater. And uh, the way that worked was that uh, the box would accept uh, wirelessly and update uh, from any source. So if you were close enough to it, you could put any kind of software on it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a challenge. So you have to think about this more uh, over these this wireless networks. And um, this is not just hypothetical. This has happened uh, a lot of times, and there are several examples of it that are publicly known. And yeah, we don't know what we don't know, obviously. Um, so one interesting thing is that, um, so when you think about the hardware for an embedded device, and I'm sure many of you have worked uh, in this industry for a long time, uh, you have this argument, okay, that uh, sure, it's slow and expensive now, but in two years or five years, it will be fast and, and we can use the same technologies, approaches that we use um, for yeah, cloud or, or servers. Uh, however, I don't think that this is true for the bandwidth. Um, I think it's, it's true for 
some aspects of the embedded device, like the storage, the CPU memory, and these kind of things. But the bandwidth, um, in general, will not follow. So I expect that the bandwidth will always be very constrained on embedded devices, and the reason I tried to indicate here. Uh, so uh, what you might think is that uh, the embedded devices will soon adopt 3G, 4G, 5G, and the Wi-Fi. Uh, like the more expensive devices use. So for bandwidth, I used uh, a smartphone. Uh, for CPU and memory, you could use a server, for example, which is, I think, a more valid argument. But for comparing a smartphone that costs, let's say, $700 and an uh, embedded device at $30, uh, they have very different use cases with respect to the bandwidth. Because for a smartphone, you want to stream YouTube or, uh, yeah, I don't know what you like to do on your smartphone, but you have much higher bandwidth requirement in order for it to be useful to the end user. Uh, so high data speed is, is very important. And the users don't mind uh, paying $700 for it, apparently. So that's, uh, that's fine. Uh, for the embedded device, on the other hand, uh, cost is very, uh, there's a very high uh, focus on cost uh, because of the scale. Uh, so you try to reduce the cost of the hardware, and you also try to use, uh, reduce it on, on the data transfer. Uh, so obviously 3G uh, are not that cheap. Um, it also has smaller size and it doesn't have to have that uh, high data speed. So for example, you can, um, in agriculture you have these devices that will be in the, in the field and the, maybe they measure the uh, moisture in, uh, in the ground in order to optimize the, uh, the fertilization. Uh, so you don't need the same kind of bandwidth uh, as you use to stream YouTube videos, uh, but you need high connectivity. So especially, so I live in the U.S. right now, and uh, the 3G coverage there is not impressive uh, if you're used to European standards. Um, so you can lose connectivity quite easily, but there are quite uh, a lot of interesting. Uh, other types of networks uh, that have a uh, much higher or longer range, but, uh, but smaller bandwidth that I think will be more adopted in embedded than, than these uh, 3G networks. So that's one aspect of the bandwidth. So um, this was sort of the criteria we found by talking to all these people about uh, how they do their embedded updates. Uh, so the first one is that it's robust and secure, meaning that it doesn't fail uh, even though you have, mm, have this embedded environment where you can lose power and, and so on, and it needs to be secure. Uh, second thing is that it integrates with existing environments. So what does this mean? Uh, so you typically have uh, some kind of build environment uh, or some and some kind of devices out there already. Uh, typically, you're not starting from scratch, and uh, uh, if you have, uh, depending on what kind of update you're looking at or what approach you're taking, it can be quite intrusive on on your existing uh, development workflows. Um, so, so that's one one thing that can be a, a showstopper for for people. Uh, easy to get started. Yeah, so many times, I don't know how, how your experience is, but um, the people we talked to, they, the way it worked was that uh, the reason the updater project got triggered in the first place was that the, just before launch for a six month uh, development cycle of uh, a new product, uh, the engineers knew that, okay, there is going to be bugs. Uh, so they kickstarted a, a quick project at the very end of the development cycle to integrate the updater. Um, so just something quick and dirty to, to get started. And if you, have a, uh, if you have a generic tool to do the updates and, and you're trying, uh, trying to help people, uh, 
uh, that's the environment they will be in. So, uh, so it needs to be very, very easy to, to get going with the update, or otherwise people will just uh, use what they're familiar with and, and get this done as, as fast as possible. Uh, other requirements, obviously bandwidth consumption, we covered that a bit. And then an interesting one is also downtime during the update. Uh, so this also, uh, yeah, so depending on, on how you do your update exactly, this can be affected. Um, and also what kind of device do you have? Can you afford to have downtime and how, how long downtime can you afford? Yeah, so we covered this a bit. Uh, an interesting property that I think has been covered in, in several talks is atomic installation. Uh, this is the definition I use for this. Uh, so it's update is either completed fully or not at all. So it's like a transaction. Uh, and that no software component can see a partially installed update, except the updater itself, of course, because it would be hard to make otherwise. Um, and consistency, we talked about that. Test and uh, production devices should be, uh, you should uh, have good confidence that they are the same, um, which is very important for uh, QA, of course. And then uh, one thing also to think about how you sanity check after the update. Uh, so the one criteria you can do there generically uh, is that you must make sure that it's possible to do another update. So whatever happens, at least you can deploy another update so, so you can fix it. Um, but this is also quite custom. It depends a bit on, on your specific device. Uh, maybe there's a service. Some people try to ping a, a server that they knew their applications needed to use. Uh, other people want to ensure that the specific application is running. It has some built-in ha uh, health checks. So in these cases, it's not really something that you can solve generically, but it has to be um, has to be extensible in some way where you can uh, have these checks carried out. Uh, and then authenticity, of course, uh, most common way of doing that is through uh, signatures of the update uh, itself. Uh, but yeah, cryptographically there are other solutions to it as well, like um, HMAC, which are a bit more complicated to manage, uh, but they're more efficient. Um, so integration, yeah, so we talked a little bit about that, uh, relates to development tools, build and test environment. You have to rework all those um, to enable updates. Uh, and then the hardware, so what storage type are you using? Uh, how big is it? And uh, what kind of network do you have? Uh, the operating system is also one component. Not all OSs might be supported. Uh, and then, yeah. Of course, you also might have devices in the field, so can you integrate with them as well, even though they are uh, already, already have a design? Um, and then there's what I call the standalone mode. I think it's fairly uh, common to distinguish between standalone and managed. So managed deployment, meaning that you have some kind of server that can control the update process. Uh, but there are still... Uh, so there's a lot of focus on, on that, obviously, because that's the way to make it scale, where you, if you have a thousand devices, you cannot run around with a USB stick to all of them uh, every two weeks. But uh, there are still devices that need uh, standalone deployment because they don't have a um, network, for example, or, uh, or that's historically how it's been done in a transition period. Uh, so that's also something to think about if... Uh, if that can be achieved with the, uh, with the updater. And extensibility. Uh, so custom update actions, typically pre, pre and post install scripts. Also this sanity checks that we mentioned earlier. Uh, an interesting one is also if you can have uh, custom installers, because um, 
especially for homegrown solutions, there's quite a few interesting ways to install an update. And if you're trying to, so it could be a tarball or it could be some package or some custom way. Um, so the question is if you can have like these installer modules inside an update that can allow you to, uh, to install in different ways and, and not just one way. So on integration, yeah, getting started, that's pretty straightforward. Typically the way it's measured is how long it takes from scratch to actually having a working update. Uh, it's too, like I mentioned also, due to the time pressure, if it's too hard, it takes too long, there's too much you have to build yourself, then uh, there's a big risk that people will not adopt it, just build some simple homegrown solution instead. Um, and then the quality aspect is obviously very important for, for an updater, very <coughs> critical component, so how do you know that? So uh, are there test reports for the updater or are there other people who are using it successfully? That's typically how, how people look at that. And documentation, of course, so it's clear how it, how it works uh, so you don't get any surprises. Uh, yeah. So for the bandwidth and downtime, obviously we want as little as possible. And um, a widely varying requirements, so uh, yeah, typically you have some kind of maintenance window that you have to respect and start and stop the update. Um, and uh, yeah, it depends also on uh, the bandwidth, clearly depends on the network. So Sigfox, uh, how many have heard about Sigfox? Okay, a couple, three, four people. Okay, yeah, that's a very low data rate ban uh, network. Uh, so it's a new infrastructure that's, um, there's one company that's building a new infrastructure uh, for networks uh, just like the 3G networks. Uh, but they're very low data rates and uh, I think the range is very, or the range is very long. So it's sort of optimized for the uh, connected embedded use cases. So if you use that, then your scenario would, uh, would look uh, quite different from, from other networks. Um, so this is an interesting one. Uh, so I've done similar talks quite a few times and uh, I tried to map out the generic steps you need in order to do the client side updater uh, in a generic way. Uh, so I, I think I started with four or six of these boxes, but then every time I did the talk, there's uh, this one guy that's, no, you need this uh, also. So uh, it's getting a bit uh, lengthy now, so I might need to add some even after this talk, but uh, in general, this is how the main parts work at least. So you need to first detect the update. So this could be also local, or you could call it to trigger the update. If you have a USB stick, that would still apply. Somebody needs to make sure it, the process starts, or if you have a managed update, then uh, the server might tell the client uh, device that you have to start updating. Uh, then you need to do some kind of compatibility check, so, um, or you should. So does, it, does the software run on the hardware? So you want to know that before you actually start installing it. Uh, you need to download it or copy it from the USB stick, uh, do checksum, authenticity, for example, signatures. In some cases, they are encrypted, especially, uh, yeah, there are some reasons for encrypting it. Uh, uh, if uh, there are vulnerabilities, maybe you want to try to encrypt it so that attackers cannot see the vulnerabilities until you actually install them. Yeah, there's a. If it's detected and downloaded, Yeah, so why, why encrypt it again if, uh, if you have a secure channel up here? Um, so it's, in cryptography, you always try to focus on end-to-end 
yeah, in, on the end to end, so that whatever happens, it's just an extra safety measure, uh, but it's always end-to-end -end encryption or end-to-end -end authenticity that's the focus. So that way you're sure that uh, nothing went wrong in, in the middle here. But in general, yeah, you're right. And I also try to indicate that this is a bit environment specific with the lighter color here. So if it, yeah, it's just an additional uh, security measure, but yeah, definitely not required. So, yep. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so this might not be a secure channel, as like this gentleman points out. Um, ideally, it is. Uh, I think. Um, yeah, that makes sense, and that also applies to the authenticity on the middle right there that if you know the channel from the source to the destination is secure, then maybe it's not that important to do signatures. But if you just get a random USB stick, then definitely you want to check it. Um, so then you do this pre-install actions. Typically what uh, these are are uh, scripts that maybe migrate some configuration files or maybe the developers have changed the format. Um, of, of some of these configuration files uh, that you need to do in order to have the new version of the application working. Uh, then you get to the uh, honeypot where you want to install the update, the reason we're doing everything uh, here. Uh, that depends obviously on how, uh, what kind of method you're using. Uh, then you have the post install, uh, you're familiar with that. The sanity checks might also be custom. And the last one is the, what you do in case it fails. So uh, ideally, you should have a way to roll back. Uh, but at least you need to have a way to detect that something fails, even though if it's just a person that manually inspects it afterwards, uh, you want to know about it. Uh, yeah, so these are sort of. Um, the generic criteria, so these things you can, uh, from the criteria we went through one to five earlier, these things you can implement no matter how you uh, install your update. If you use a full image or package uh, or so on, you can always have this um, implemented. Uh, so sanity checking and authenticity, you can sign any kind of blob basically, for example. And you can have standalone deployments, no matter if you have a package or a image. Uh, yeah, so I'll go through these quickly. I think these have been covered in uh, previous talks a bit, so how, how you can go about installing the updates. Um, so one is what I call runtime installation. So uh, then you would have uh, some kind of package manager, maybe, or OS3, or tar GZ file that you just install in user space. Uh, that way it's harder to do robustness because it's harder to, uh, you don't have atom atomicity. So while the package manager is installing the updates, uh, application can read partial data or partially installed uh, data. Um, but uh, it integrates well. Uh, like mentioned before, many people have already package managers or at least they're able to uh, package up some uh, tarball of the file they want to use. Um, low bandwidth, obviously the one megabyte is just some uh, vague indicator. Uh, and then short downtime was one of the other requirements uh, that we found. Uh, so typically, you just install a package, maybe restart a service. Uh, so this is what I call uh, the second approach is to boot to maintenance mode. Uh, it's also called the recovery OS. Uh, also a bit hard to do robustness in this case. Uh, either the bootloader or you have some minimal system that runs alongside the, the main rootfs. 
uh, that updates the, the rootFS or the, the user space. Um, so obviously in this case you can you can start an update and it you can lose power and uh, that way when you reboot you could run into a partial update um, and uh, but it integrates fairly well as, as well not that many changes to the existing system uh, you need the whole image and then you also will have a very long downtime because uh, you first have to reboot into the recovery OS. Uh, then you have to install, so write the entire image, and then you have to reboot again into the uh, rootFS. So you have a whole image install and two, uh, two reboots in this case. Uh, this uh, third strategy is uh, quite common, I think, uh, called symmetric or dual AB rootFS. So that way the image is written to the other rootFS. You have two of them. Uh, this one is fully atomic and consistent. Uh, it integrates fairly well. There are some things to worry about with respect to the partition layout. You will use double the rootFS storage. Uh, you also need to have some bootloader support to switch the partition uh, to boot from. Um, so there's uh, some integration work. Uh, it also uses high, high bandwidth. You need a whole image. Uh, the little star there, I guess you in the front row can see it. Um, so you can uh, mitigate it with Delta updates as you're probably familiar with. Uh, the downtime, the interesting thing here is that uh, you don't have to take down your system as you install the update because the updater in A uh, can install the update while the user space applications in AR are still running. Um, and then the only downtime you will have is between you boot from A to B. So there's one reboot in, in downtime. So it's lower than the recovery or maintenance mode update. Uh, so the last one, which is a bit different, uh, semantically, is that you can use a remote uh, system so proxy-based updates. So typically you do this in very resource-constrained devices that cannot run any extra updater agent. Uh, the default scenario you have here is that you have, or one example is in, in home automation in the core IoT um, space where you have a gateway that runs some intelligent updater maybe running on Linux. And then you have some temperature sensors or some lights uh, that you can uh, update over Bluetooth or Zigbee or another protocol. Uh, so then you you uh, you might use this strategy. So, but it's not really an apples to apples comparison to the others. Uh, but obviously the gateway can control uh, that device uh, at least to some extent, uh, even when when the update fails. Uh, yeah. So this is the summary of how uh, <laughs> the pros and cons with the green and red. Uh, so it uh, depends on really what, what your focus uh, is, uh, if it's on bandwidth or it's that it needs to be atomic, for example. And then uh, re uh, remote deployment. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think we should start moving towards this now and stop, uh, try to stop using the USBs, especially in once uh, now that we get uh, so many devices. Um, I guess now, you might not have seen all the Gartner reports, but uh, you might not need to trust them either. But uh, uh, the point is that we'll have more devices to deal with and uh, we need to move to a more uh, centrally managed way of managing these updates. So uh, you typically do that with um, a server and uh, uh, have the ability to group devices. Perhaps you have a very risk averse customer that you want to uh, be the last one to, to get the updates and you have a very uh, bleeding edge customer that loves to get bugs, uh, maybe not, but at least to try the newest features. Uh, so you might want to group it by customer and then roll it to the more 
to the less risk averse customer first. Uh, there's also this word campaign management, which means that you can uh, do this in, in phases. So you can do maybe 1% of the devices, then 5 and, and 10 maybe, before you roll out to the entire uh, fleet. And then there's the reporting aspect that you need also. Uh, to know that the update was successful or it failed, maybe you need to retry it. So these are all uh, requirements for the, for the server side. Uh, so, to ensure that your devices can be updated, you need to f figure out one of these strategies, and I'm sure you've heard enough about them during this conference. Uh, I also think you should at least look at the open source tools that are out there before uh, starting to, to build your own. Uh, and then, yeah, of course, I'm a uh, little bit biased since I work on the Mender. So you can try out the standalone deployment in, uh, or, yeah, in 10 minutes, uh, roughly. Uh, so we have some pre-built images so you can see if it fits your needs or, or not. Uh, and our end goal is uh, to sleep better after all. So we want to get rid of this one, uh, even though we don't know about him as we release the uh, the devices to the field. So uh, that's it. Any questions or comments? Yes. <coughs> so you talk about the AB model on Mender. Yeah. Um, do you have also procedures? You know, if, if my root device is not laid out the way it should be for AB, do you have procedures for you know first up oh. to the new AB partitioning and then? So uh, uh, the question is if Mender has a way to migrate existing devices that do not have this partition layout uh, to have it. Uh, the answer is we don't have that. Uh, I think it's quite difficult to do. If you have some uh, thoughts about how we can do it, then it would be interesting, but. <laughs> well, the thing is, yeah. Yeah, so that migration. That's kind of a chicken egg problem. If, if, I, if, because if you talk about existing yep. projects, and yep. so I might have stuck with my shell script and then I had. Mm. Um, if I get a robust way to move to better, better strategy. Yeah, and uh, so one way that might be a bit easier to do it is that you can. Um, you can uh, have this new partition layout in new devices, but then, uh, I don't know if you use package-based updates or, yeah, uh, today, you can use, still use those on the older devices until they're decommissioned. So, uh, because the server side, our server, and I think yeah, most other servers, they have an API, so you can basically write a client to them. So from the server side, you can manage both package-based and image-based deployments. Um, so, of course, your existing devices won't be have a uh, as robust update process as the new one, but that's uh, one way to migrate more softly. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Just the entire not, alphabet. Yeah, space is not the issue. The issue yeah. would be, you know, the whole process yeah. to align. <coughs> right. Yeah, it's an interesting problem, especially if you're trying to avoid any kind of uh, uh, critical 
points where you don't, where you cannot lose power. That, uh, that's, yeah. Any other questions, comments, or are we all ready for the drink reception? Good. Okay, thank you.